called boxing. So that's a lot of good stuff, a lot of bad stuff. Sometimes it's ugly, sometimes it's dangerous, everything in between. So if that is something that you are up for, you're in the perfect spot. If not, no worries. Plenty of other boxing podcasts out there that you can go listen to that'll cover more of like, I guess you could say the popular subjects, right? So if you're up for the wild world of, world of Tim Boxeo and all things club boxing, strap in. We have a great show here for you guys today. Let me introduce the man of the hour, the one who does most of the talking around here. That is the TC Boxing Hall of Famer. Someday we'll describe what the hell that even means. The most reliable source for fight results that don't wind up on BoxRec, that is Tim Boxeo. Tim, how's it going? <laughs> Good, Angela. You know, I made a joke to you the other day that sometimes it feels like we follow two different sports. And on the introduction, you mentioned Brandon Figueroa. And I was just kind of busy at work today. And I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Like, I have no clue. Keep it that way. <laughs> it's okay, it's, it's right, nothing. Okay. It, it, it will dim your mood, most likely. Okay, I'll check it out when we're done recording. But yeah, I'm doing good yourself. Yeah, I'm doing real good. Although I did wake up today feeling like, damn, what the hell? I did nothing yesterday and I feel like I did something. You know, my body was sore. I don't know what the hell is going on. But Every all day. things, yeah, I guess that's part of getting older. Yeah. So well, we anyway. Had, dude, here's the thing, man. We had a huge, it ended up being, I was preparing for the show. It ended up being a huge weekend of club boxing. And I just really didn't expect it going in. So we've got an awesome show because there are some really cool stuff to talk about that. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing. So it'll be fun. All right. Well, what is the story of the week? I would assume that it is the one show that I think just about everyone followed. I mean, I was so shocked that Hassan McQueen, Moaquino has a huge Twitter following. And yeah. not just that, they like interact with him. Like his tweets had crazy inner, um, what is the word? Engagement. Yeah. So we got to be leading off there, right? <laughs> we are, but l like I said, and like you mentioned at the uh, at the top of the show, <clears throat> there are five or six events that happened over the weekend that you know if we if we drill down on them in the uh, results section of our podcast, you know we'd be here for two and a half hours. So I just wanted to use the story of the week this week to start off with running through those five or six events that, like you said, are not did not end up on box rec or were not covered by, you know, fight news or boxing scene and, and some of the main publications, but listeners to our show, it, it will be names that they're familiar with. So I think they'll really enjoy it. And yeah, you know, the first one is Hassan Mokinho. And like you said, he has a huge Twitter following of people that are really diehard fans. And it goes back to our story. I think it was last week. I mean, that's Sam Aggington when Mokinho is a national treasure in Tanzania. I mean, they love that man. And it's amazing. He's only 26 years old. So yeah. <clears throat> it seems like he's been fighting for a long time. Still a really young guy and a ton of upside. He, uh, like you said, he, it was Friday and it, it was a typical scene in Tanzania. Just parades beforehand, parades after, uh, the, 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 the country just went crazy when light middleweight Hassan Mokinho improved to 20 and two with 14 knockouts and forced a TKO four over former world champion Julius Ndongo falls to 23 and four and Mokinho defends his ABU light middleweight title in, uh, in Tanzania. Um, and Dongo looked kind of like a, a, a it was, a, it was somewhat on the sad side. You know, I don't think beating this form of Ndongo is going to catapult Mokinho into, uh, you know, that level where he wants to go. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good name on his, on his resume as he continues to string wins together. He's on one hell of a streak here. And, and yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I wanted to ask a question, and I, I, I don't know, maybe this is kind of an ignorant question, but... Hassan Mokinho, clearly national hero in Tanzania. Was there like extra significance placed on this fight because Ndongo's from Nabi Nambia? 
If I said that wrong, um, guys, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a good question. Because this thing crossed over in a way that I don't expect. Like, when most of my timeline has the scent of Tim Boxeo on it, I know that <laughs> this is, like, not normal. Like, usually, you tweet about things, and the things that you tweet about, you're the only one that's tweeting about them. But the uh, Joaquino and Indongo stuff was just coming at my timeline from all different t angles. Yeah, I think a, a lot of people were interacting with me as I was putting stuff out about the lead up to it and all that. Uh, I I think had a had a lot of people interested in 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 Dongo just as much as Moquino as far as boxing Twitter goes for whatever that's worth. And uh, yeah, I mean I think I I don't know the right way to say it. I always call it Nambia. I'm probably that's probably incorrect. N A M I B I A Namibia. Oh, N Namibia. <laughs> they actually they actually have some really fun shows on Facebook. That's a different story for a different day. But uh, they, they throw a lot of club shows that are really well put together. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I think I think that's probably true. And then, you know, Africa wise, it was a true ABU title bout. You know, it wasn't guy. F it wasn't some guy from Wisconsin, you know, fighting Joaquinho for the ABU title. So. It was truly an African Boxing Union event. Uh, well, can you look good? I mean, I think he's 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 won ten in a row now since dropping, um, since his last defeat all the way back in 2017 in uh, in Russia. So, and that includes the Eggington win, and Indongo is probably the other biggest win on his ledger here in those ten wins. We'll see where he goes from here. Yeah, he's young enough that I think he's going to get brought in for an opportunity somewhere. And like just looking at the reaction, I mean, I guess Twitter likes don't always translate to legitimate business in terms of what you bring into the venue. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're looking for clout or something, why wouldn't you want to bring in like a super well to wait? Jesus Ramos just fought this past weekend on Fox. He's 20. Like Marquinho might be a pretty good opponent for where he's at, like where you actually have a fight. It's like, yeah. I mean, Ramos is a blue chip prospect, but Marquinho can fight. Yeah. Yeah, he's a damn good fighter. And he's got, I mean, let's face it, beyond the top, how, how do I say this? I mean, Marquinho is a very well-known name within, you know, boxing hardcore circles, whether that be Reddit, Twitter, YouTube, whatever communities you want to talk about. Everyone knows Hassan Marquinho after that Eggington win. And so, yeah, I mean, he's he's in a good position. He's and he's a good fighter. He's fun to watch. He's exciting. He's aggressive. Uh, it'll be fun. And it'll be exciting to see the Tanzanians go crazy about it because nobody loves boxing like they do. It's fantastic. So there's one. OK, one, uh, four or five more or this one. Talk about deep, deep, deep under the radar. Oh, my gosh. Because this is a guy we talked about multiple times on the show mm -hmm. and just hit showbox. Amazingly enough, 22-year-old Chenard Bunch fought this weekend in Springdale, Arkansas, of all places. And boy, Bunch, I think it just comes down to Bunch just likes to fight. And he wants to fight as much as possible. He improves the 16-1-1, one, one, 14 KOs, a real lopsided TK over one over someone named Zachariah Kelly. And Kelly falls to five, 32 and one. Kelly's got some names on his ledger, but uh, Bunch made quick work of him. This fight was thrown up on BoxRec at the last second because of one of the Morrison sons ended up fighting on the card. And, it, and Bunch's event, or Bunch's fight, was put up uh, right before the fight went live. So on uh, fight week, it wasn't on there but yeah shoot i mean bunch is one two three four five six seven he has fought seven times this year if for a prospect of his caliber that's unheard of um so a couple of things springdale arkansas do you know what that is close to <laughs> i've been to springdale arkansas but i don't know where you're going with this so fire away <laughs> it's uh me master of geography here it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very close, maybe like 50 miles. 
if I'm like can trust a little like legend here. It's about 50 mm-hmm. miles from the Ozarks. Oh yeah. Popular TV show on Netflix. One. Correct. Two. Mm-hmm. Do we know who Shenard Bunch is promoted by? Because Ooh. this guy just fought on Showbox and had a very impressive showing. He took a guy, Janelson Boca Chica, who looked like a pretty decent prospect. And Bunch really outboxed him, should have won that fight. I mean, I understand why he got a draw there. And it just kind of, that's the way it plays out. I mean, it says that Russell Peltz is manager slash agent. At least that's Russell Peltz at a minimum just paid the 25 bucks or whatever it is to get his name there. Uh, But (laughs) what a step down. You go from an opponent who is like a rising welterweight prospect to now facing a guy who's 532 and one. Yeah, and I don't know anything about the bout, you know, because there's always so much stuff going on behind the scenes, all this, you know that. And, you know, it could very well be that Bunch has a fight, you know, pretty much well inked in, you know, end of October, early November. And like I said, just Bunch being Bunch, where the guy just wants to fight every other month. He's like, you know what, screw it. Uh, There's a chance in, in Arkansas, I'll go knock this guy out, and then we'll be ready in October. I mean, that kind of stuff backfires all the time on fighters. But this is the kind of guy he is. This was set for a, this was a four round fight. Shenard Bunch, this equal was, opportunity knockout artist. He will show up wherever you need somebody to get knocked out. I'm telling you. And like you said about Boca Chica, and I, I mentioned this when we talked about that fight. As a Shenard Bunch fan, of which I am, you know he did everything I would wanted to see in that fight. I mean, the way he outboxed Boca Chica, who's a pretty damn good boxer. Uh, someone known in bunch to be just a, you know, a knockout artist to go in there and show the boxing skills that he showed was just off the charts for me as a, just as a fan and nothing more as a fan. I was like, this is exactly what I wanted. I know this kid's got a lot of potential. So this is uh this is exciting for me. So yeah, man, that was great. And why this fight happened, you know, I don't know. Wait, I, did I, you, you watched it? Yeah. The bunch fight. Yeah. I watched it. Yeah, okay, it was can on you Facebook. Just tell us, yeah, like with each of these, how you watched it. Okay, yeah, sure. So the Facebook one was really kind of difficult. This Arkansas one was difficult to watch. It was difficult to find um, information on. But once I kind of zeroed in on who the what the gym was that they were that was promoting the show, um, I wasn't a hundred percent sure it was going to be broadcast live. But I just kept checking there facebook on fight night and then they started going live so i missed the first couple fights and the uh the stream quality was terrible um but you got the gist of what was happening (laughs) and with bunch's fight lasting about 90 seconds it didn't really much matter so that one was a little a a little difficult back to the moquino one if you'd like to know that real quick so i watched that was a little more yeah that was a little more complicated I paid for I paid five bucks on the Azam TV app out of Tanzania, which is completely above board. You can download their app, pay five bucks for a week, and that's the way I watched it. But I know tons of people were asking me for ways to watch it, so it was just scouring YouTube for Joaquinho's name, and it was really really difficult. I'm not kidding; like it took me all day on Friday to get an even remotely watchable one. And I even missed like the first round of the fight because I was trying to get links out for other people that they could watch. And then like the third round, I found a a much, much better one and then posted that in our Discord. But yeah, people were putting up bootleg streams on YouTube like crazy. So that's that's probably how you watched it too. Okay, so we had Joaquinho in Tanzania. We had Schnard Bunch in the Ozarks with my girl Ruth. And then what else do we have? Ruth's a great character. So next is right where we would want to go next. Friday night in San Luis, Rio, Rio, Colorado, Mexico, right near Mexicali. So right up the road from Tijuana, we had rising heavyweight star DeAndre Savage moved to 2-0 with two knockouts, signed to Lovejoy Boxing, TKO1, and Repo Rick sang him into the ring. Repo sang his whoop that ass song as he brought uh, DeAndre Savage into the ring. And uh, Crystal Lovejoy was uh, in town, but 
Chris uh, stayed out of the stayed out of the limelight, and it was uh, DeAndre and and Repo. So DeAndre got a quick TKO one. I DeAndre's a big guy. He's got to be about two seventy five and about six four six five. And his opponent had to be about 5'10", 210 <laughs> pounds, <laughs> if if that. So, uh, you know, DeAndre was out of the sport for a while, playing American football. And I say rising star, you know, you look at him and he's not, you know, he's not cut up like Anthony uh, Joshua or uh, Philip Hergovic or any of these guys. You know, DeAndre is a little bigger around the waist. But listen, you know, the guy was on – the U.S. Uh, uh, was at the U.S. Olympic trials as an amateur. And, you know, say what you want. You make it to the U.S. Olympic trials as an amateur. You're doing something right. You know, does it ensure success as a pro? Of course not. But it's not like Lovejoy just, you know, picks Savage up from around the corner and puts some boxing gloves on him. So he was out for a while, get some, get some fights under his belt in Mexico, and then uh, we'll kind of see where he goes from there. All right. Repo Rick gets another mention on the podcast. Hit one on the calendar for him. <laughs> Let's stay. <laughs> Repo is a fan favorite. Uh, Re- Repo is a fan favorite. We got to get Repo on the podcast. Oh my gosh. We, we would have to plan for a three hour podcast stuff. Uh, you know, well, I don't know how we would reel him in, but, um, Let's stay in Mexico because last week our guest was the first two-time guest of the Tim Boxeo show, the former Tijuana commissioner Alejandra Phoenix Ayala fought at Big Punch in, on Saturday. I don't think this show was on BoxRec yet, and it wasn't prior to the show. And No, it's still not on there. She fought a six round fight first time she's been back in the ring in over 18 months improved to 14 and 5 took unanimous to six vic- decision six victory over Milagros Gabriela Diaz who falls to 1 in 14 it was a light middleweight bout now Diaz is, in her 14 losses had never been knocked out and you know it's not a real nice looking record on her side of things but perfect opponent for Alejandra to come back after 18 months Diaz was a really tough lady and really comes to fight. She's not a pretty fighter to watch, but Diaz comes to fight hard to knock out and always throwing punches. So Alejandra got good six rounds of work in. And like we talked about last week, she's looking for big fights. So we'll see where she goes from here. Good job. And shout out to fan favorite of the show, Alejandra Phoenix Ayala. I don't know how I watched some clips from this, but I did. I just want to throw that out there. Oh, good. Yeah. It was on Facebook and a really nice stream, actually. And that's really... Tijuana shows are really easy to watch on Facebook. It's just a matter of whether you have the fortitude to get through it. Because it's like four hours and never less than 15 fights. And it's really hard to tell who's fighting and who, you know... But uh, the stream quality is actually really good. It's just you can't hear much. So you really, I, I always have to do a lot of prep to make it worth my time. All right. I'm going to make a quick, uh, a quick switch here to, for the last two before we go on to the fight of the week, which is one of my favorite boxing countries. And on my Patreon standalone podcast – that you can check out at patreon.com backslash Tim Boxale. I did a breakdown of the first two years of the career of blue chip prospect from Ghana, Alfred Lamptey. And Lamptey was in the main event in Ghana on Saturday. It was broadcast live on Fight TV pay-per-view. I paid 10 bucks for it. Super easy to see. Really nice stream. And the card went for about five hours. So you got your 10 bucks worth. <laughs> <laughs> typical of Ghana too. It started like three hours late, even though it was on fight TV. They, they started at, um, about three, uh, four thirty us Eastern time, which is about 10, nine 30, 10 30. 
on a car that had like 10, 12 fights on it. It's just, it's great. So Lamptey was fighting at like one in the morning, one thirty in the morning. Uh, he's 19 years old. He improves the nine and all with seven knockouts and he got a TKO 10 victory over a Tanzanian named Idi Kuyamba who falls to 13, four and two. And this was a super featherweight bout, but Kayamba was really, really looked like a featherweight, if not maybe a super bantamweight. He's just a really small, skinny guy. And Lamptey looks like he's got a grown man body in his 19-year-old frame. And it was really impressive. I mean, Lamptey is still rough in some spots. He gets hit a little bit too much. He sometimes when he's on the front foot, he gets really aggressive and goes for the clothes when maybe it's not there. Instead of, you know, setting up the clothes, he just kind of steps forward and just starts letting his hands go, which makes for a, a fun watch. But, you know, someone that's a good counter puncher is going to make him pay. So he's got some got some things to learn. But this kid has all the tools. Now, I was talking to my friend Kofi over uh, or messaging with him anyway, who runs KBox TV that broadcasts the fights in Ghana. And he said, Lamptey's known in town for being a, just a relentless worker. I mean, the kid's very intense. He's always in the gym, putting the work in. And as far as the boxing scene in Ghana goes, he's got some of the best trainers around him. He's with one of the best, if not the best promotional team so it'd just be a matter, really, of when is the right time for Lamptey to leave Ghana, you know, and 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 branch out to the UK or the United States, and 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 who's going to help him make that transition? Because this, this kid is going to be someone who will be challenging for a world title, you know, whether or not he's someone that can win and you know stay champion at the level. I guess we'll we'll see as he develops, but. He's getting better every fight, and he's really, really fun to watch. Really calm pro style, and uh, it was an impressive win here because Kayumba was an animal. I mean, that guy just refused to go away. I enjoyed watching this fight. Really good stuff. And uh, if you are so inclined, I suppose you could go back to Fight TV and watch it and pay 10 bucks and watch the replay. But uh, Lamptey will be busy. He'll be fighting again here soon within the next three months, I'm sure. So that was a fun one to watch. All right. Well, I mean, we go to the next part is when you talk about the fight of the week. But it sounds like, I mean, how are you going to how are you going to have a fight of the week when you just talk to us about a very entertaining fight? Was there something better? I did. There was something better. Let me mention a quick alibi before we move me forward. I forgot one. I just wanted to mention 18-year-old flyweight prospect Mohamed Golden Boy Ariti improved to 5-0 and on that same Ghana show with an RTD3 win. And Ariti is a flyweight, which brings up some challenges in, in Africa, um, unless he's in South, you know, South Africa or some places. So we'll see how he develops. We've talked about him before in the show. Um, someone I'd call a, fr- a friend of mine, really nice kid. And I think he's got a lot of talent. So I wanted to mention that real quick. Okay, so yes, the fight of the weekend was one I want to share in a little more detail with you than I just did on those recaps, if that's cool. And we were, or I was live on really late Saturday night, which was, or depending on how you look at it, super early Sunday morning. So a Sunday evening main event in Fuji, Japan. And I bought this on pay-per-view. It cost me 18 US dollars. And there were, it was event was, the title event was all main events. So they had five eight round fights that from the promoter's perspective could have all themselves been main events, main events. And I tweeted something out that this was easily in 2021, the best $18 $18 I've I had spent the best dollar for dollar you know event I had purchased all year long because all five fights were excellent there was a great knockout in one there was just a tremendous four uh four rounds of action in a scheduled eight round bout um a, the other two fights were really good and then this was the main event that I want to share with you and I will set it up and walk you through it if that's okay. So 
we had in the red corner, super featherweight, Rentar- Rentaro Kimura. He's 4-0, and he's going to face Yoji Sato, who's 3-1-2. and two. So Kimura is a 24-year-old southpaw, turned pro in just July of last year. And Sato, over in the blue corner, been at this three years now. A little bit of a rocky start, but he's off now to a run of 2-0. and oh, And that brings his record, of course, what I just mentioned, to 3-1-2. and two. And Sato is in black and white trunks coming out of the blue corner. It's got the advertisements, as most of these Japanese fighters do, on them. And Kamura is fighting out of the red corner, and he's littered with <laughs> littered with advertisements as well. Kamura is looks like for the weight for 130 pounds, he's long. He's got uh, you know uh, pretty tall, got long arms. So I guess we'll see as this fight progresses, and I share this with you how that plays into the fight. Now, Sato fighting out of the blue corner with the blue gloves, mostly white trunks, some black trim. He has some advertising on his trunks. And and Sato, interesting about him, well-tanned young man, so he's he's outside a lot. And as is popular right now, he has his hair dyed in gray. Normally, I see that in a lot of females across social media. But my man's got his hair dyed Tim, what are you in, doing on TikTok? In, a, in a gray tint. Yeah, I know. Hey, shout out to the Tim Boxeo TikTok. Check me out on TikTok. No, wait. Yeah, TikTok. Jeez, I'm so old. I wasn't even sure I was talking about the red app. All right. So, yes, I do put KOs on TikTok. But our man, our man Sato has his hair dyed in gray. So let's kick off the fight. I'll break this down for you and we'll walk through it. So with the opening bell rings for round number one and Kimura is measured and kind of, excuse me, Sato is, is providing the measured aggression, right? He's Sato's coming forward. Kimura is mostly by fighting off the back foot, trying to use his length here in the first round to his advantage. Nice sp- use of space and distance. And Kamira here through the first round trying to close the distance. And uh, about 30 seconds left in the first round, Kamira closes the distance, uh, backing Sato up into the corner. But Sato, as that distance is closing, lands a left-right hook combination, nice in tight, and down goes Kamira. So 30 seconds into the first, we have a knockdown and a potential upset on our hands as Kamira, the 4-0 fighter fighting out of the red corner, has just hit the canvas. He's back on his feet quickly. You can tell, though, that he's on wobbly legs. I mean, he felt that. This is more than a flash knockdown. The ref finishes his eight count and signals the restart. And we've got about 30 seconds left here. Kamira now moving around, staying in a distance, staying out of danger, tying up when he needed to. And... Sato just can't get inside to land any more meaningful shots. It's clear that Kamira has his legs underneath him again. He's starting to work the jab. Nice recovery. And while Sato can't capitalize on the knockdown out of the blue corner, overall in the first round did a really nice job, I think, of just applying effective aggression, very calm, very measured. And end of round one comes to an end. But now I'm at the edge of my seat. I'm thinking, all right, we got the man in the red corners bent down. He's fighting maybe a potentially bad style for him as both these guys really try to power up and get ready for the second round. But I'm impressed with both fighters. I mean, in Japan, you can't really judge the book by its cover. I've mentioned this in previous shows. Somebody like Sato, who's 3-1-2, and two, is going to be matched tough really early in his career. So the fact that he lost one in a couple of draws. It's just not something that you can hang your hat on when you're Kamira coming into this fight. And it's clear Kamira is someone with more skill and experience than you'd expect from a 24-year-old fighter with only four fights. So both of them raised pretty well out of their gyms with good amateur experience. And 
We're ready to start the second round. The bell here starts the round, and Sato again attacking, but this time with a little more urgency, jumps on Kamara right from the start. Kamara now, again, trying to keep distance, and now he is trying, Kamara is trying to get inside. So now we've got the Kamara, who's typically on his back foot, stepping inside while Sato trying to fight off the front foot, just Excellent action as these guys are coming together in the center of the ring and really letting their hands go. Kamira, though, doing more effective job, even though he does come in and let his hands go, of landing some nice one-twos, working behind his jab, counter shots, really nice. And Kamira, through two rounds, is really putting a nice effort in and sticking to his game plan after being down in the canvas in the first. So, the second round is a career round for me. Now, the third, fourth, and fifth rounds, if I could fast forward a little bit for you, overall, Kamira does a very good job staying away, punching at the distance. The one caveat in the fourth, again, the distance closes. Sato does a really nice job towards the end of the round, only about 10 seconds left in the round, and, and lands a nice hard shot inside and drops Kamira again in the fourth. So I give Sato the fourth round but it looked to be a flash knockdown. So third, fourth, and fifth, Kamara does a really nice job, but in the fourth, does hit the canvas. So Kamara now fighting out of the red corner as we get ready for the sixth round has been down twice in only an eight-round bout. So let's move now on to the sixth round. And Sato, again, bell rings to open up, attacks from the opening bell, gets in close, and for some reason, Kamira agrees. This is the way we're going to fight. He's fighting right back the same way. We're in close now here as both men are showing up. We've got a phone booth fight. Both fighters trading inside, head, body, taking their turns. Tremendous back and forth action. And we're only a minute into the sixth round. No clinches, no need for the referee to step in. Each man really stepping back, creating some space, letting their hands go. Really, really fun round to watch. But a minute left now here in the sixth round. Sato is cut over his right eye. A Khmer right hand lands hard, breaks that right eye open. Just a few seconds later here, I'm noticing for the first time then that both fighters are bleeding from the nose. First time I'm noticing that. Now we're right down to about 30 seconds left now in the sixth round. Sato lands some heavy power shots both to the head and the body in the final 30 seconds, really trying to put it on Kamara, who's backpedaling. Even with a strong close to the round, though, I'll give that round to Kamara on what was, in my opinion, on any level, a round of the year candidate in the sixth round. Just tremendous action from the, the minute the, the bell started the round to the bell that just finished it. Excellent stuff. Fighters are exhausted now in both corners after the sixth round. It does look like Sato's a little worse to the wear, especially with his come forward style, even though Kamara has been on the, on the canvas twice. Sato is looking pretty tired. The seventh round, even more drama. The bell rings there. Kamara is doing what he does best, staying at a distance, tying up when needed. I'm going to give the seventh to Kamara. So we move now to the eighth and final round. So on my scorecard going in the eighth and final round, I have Kamara up, even though he's been down twice, 66-64, and this will be the final round of the fight. So technically the fight here hanging in the balance, and both Kamara and Sato get off their stools. They both look like they've been through hell through seven rounds, and they have. This has been a brutal fight. They touch gloves at the center ring, and they're off. Kamira now trying to fight at a distance as we start off the eighth round. And he's doing a real nice job of it. Sato, again, trying to close the distance, letting both hands go as he does. And Kamira, though, fighting inside as well. He's being really effective there. But he's also backing up at the same time, doing a, a really nice uh, and effective uh, fight at a distance. We've got about 60 seconds to go in the eighth round. And Kamira now forcing the fight. He is now on the front foot. He's pushing Sato backwards. Just 30 seconds left on the in the fight. Sato 
on very shaky legs. And I think it's fair to say Kamira needs this round to win the fight. It's hard to tell what the judges will come up with. Sato backing up, trying to stay on his feet. It's just seconds away from looking like a Kamira knockout. And the bell rings to end the fight. Sato somehow survives the eighth round. There's no doubt Kamira takes it. Both men just absolutely exhausted. We're over in in uh, Kamira's corner. Sato has to stumble all the way back to the blue corner. And his corner comes rushing out to grab him and help him over onto his stool. I think as we wait for the scorecards to be read, there's a legitimate round of the year in the sixth round on any level of fights that you watch. And then depending on levels, at least on the club level, which we're talking about today, a definite fight of the year contender on my list. I give the 10th to Kamira, as I said, the 24 year old Southpaw on my card wins 76, 73 and the scorecards are about to be read. First one, 75, 75. Overruled by the two cards with the same score, 76-74. And the winner is announced a majority decision eight victory for Rentero Camira, who does improve to 5-0 and against the very game and very tough Yoji Sato, who falls to 3-2-2. Two, and two. Excellent, excellent fight on Sunday from Japan, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. Well worth my $18.00. And uh, a very long night of uh, of live boxing, but it was fantastic. I I just so happy I saw it. It was it was an incredible fight to watch. And will there be any way for people to see this fight now that they've heard you talk about it? Will it be in the show notes or something like that? <laughs> it won't. But I bet you we could if you really would like to see the fight. Send me a, a message on any of the social media and I will help you find a way to see it. How about that? That sounds fair. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm always curious, like, do judges like these types of fights that are back and forth and while they're entertaining, kind of difficult to score? Or does a judge prefer like a pretty easy sort of like, yeah, it's very clear to see who's winning and it makes their life I guess you could say their job easier. I wonder if the judges prefer that to like these all out action fights where it's kind of difficult to see who is having more success. Gosh, you'd think they'd want the easy way through, wouldn't you? I mean, it's yeah, so much pressure. You? Yeah, I mean, it's so much pressure. I, I think I've said like a million times in my boxing life that, you know, I'm not, I'm just glad I wasn't a judge in that fight. I mean, there's you feel like there's so many fights like that. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. I... I would think they would want the easy way. That'd be my gut. Look, I've definitely posted scores online before. And while I am like in line with judges over 90% of the time with my cards, it's so crazy that the one time like people don't agree with it, how much criticism and invalidation of everything you've done in the past (laughs) comes out. And and that's not like, to get sympathy it's just to say like it, judging is a difficult job because when you do it right you're invisible nobody pays attention nobody gives you credit nobody does anything you're invisible but when you get it wrong all of that becomes invalidated and you are the worst person in the world kind of like refereeing and I, I think there's like that um c- certainly in boxing that statement is true where it's like if the referee is invisible they are doing a good job and that's it's it's i guess the way to sum it up is like it's really thankless but anyway speaking of thankless um that was the highlights from the weekend but do we have any not top 10 moments we do we do really quick but l- l- let me make one statement based on what you just said and you know it's it, it we should we should we should have a a story of the week and just talk about scoring because i i tweeted something that I wish I wouldn't have tweeted over the weekend about about. Oh my god! I read the replies, Tim. It was not bad at all. How to? Oh gosh! How to score around with with knockdowns? And right. it's just there's some crazy stuff. But my point I was going to make actually had nothing to do with that. Was what you said? You know, 
um, I mean, there's a reason why the judges are on three different sides of the ring, right? I mean, you, you, we watch a fight from home and everyone's like, okay, well, that was clearly a 116-112 fight. But, I mean, if you just think about it from a from a logical perspective, you have two people sitting on different sides of the ring. It's It's very likely that they're not going to agree on every round. I mean, that should be expected because of their the way they're viewing the fight. Mm-hmm. And that's the fail safe built into the way fights are scored to make sure that not we, not that we get a unanimous decision on a fight that we think should be a unanimous decision, but that we get to the right winner. You know I mean? So yeah, it's a very difficult job and uh, I'd love to, I'd love to dive deeper into that conversation. We should, we'll plan that for an upcoming episode. Yeah. I I've been lucky enough to be ringside for some really, really good fights and one of the things that I always do is I'll message people who are watching on TV during the fight to say, who do you think won that round? Because watching it up close, even from ringside, the action can, like half of the action could happen 15, 20 feet away from where you're at. Yeah. And you're close and you can like see the sweat and you can feel the reverberation of the punches landing, but it's still, you're... 20 30 feet away from what's happening and so that that doesn't necessarily always give you the best perspective at least when you're sitting like ringside um i mean spence porter is a fight that you know i was very close to and i was like this is nuts like first of all the action is so happening so fast it was like you know blistering pace i mean but watching it live i was like i think spence has clearly won here and then come to find like people weren't super conflicted, but it was definitely within the realm of having that conversation of closeness. But, uh, anyway, yeah, I I've, think... heard ton, I've heard a ton of people, a ton. I mean, you know, half dozen people that are ringside all the time mention just how different fights look when you're sitting there versus when you're watching it on TV. It's a very common takeaway. But anyway, you all gotta right. talk about the not top 10. Well, and I, this will this will be short because I don't have any details. But let's earmark this conversation because, like I said, Saturday's fights at Big Punch weren't on BoxRec, and there were two fights that made it on the broadcast. That, in my research, I, I was able to capture maybe eight or ten fights that were going to go down, but I didn't have a bout sheet. So these two fights I missed. But we had at least <laughs> we had two fighters from the U.S. come down. To Mexico and engage in fights that uh, probably lasted about 15 to 20 seconds, maybe 30 at the most, maybe one or two punches. I'm not sure. A few, a few soft stoppages. So uh, let's just earmark this conversation. It'll be uploaded to Box Rec here in the next couple of weeks. It'll be interesting to look at what, if any, suspensions came out of those fights too. So I am going to make a note for myself and we'll revisit this in an upcoming episode. See, look what happened. The moment Alejandra leaves the commission. Yep. We got these quick little fights. Yep. Interesting. I know. All right. Who is ready to leave club level? All right. Well, you know, what was really cool. Sunday night we had a club show essentially until maybe, you know, maybe, maybe there was a fight or two that, you could wouldn't call on the club level, but Sunday night we had the PBC on FS1 and PBC on Fox show. That was fantastic. I I thought it was excellent. I saw some more mainstream people really kind of shitting on the undercard, and I was like, wow. I I mean, for club boxing, I thought that was undercard was great. What and do you expect with the guy that's three and oh? <laughs> I, I, I know exactly, and th- that's the guy I wanted to mention was Trayvon Marshall who I'd never seen before fighting out of Maryland, 20 year old light middleweight. And I think I tweeted this out. I mean, the very first thing I noticed when they went to center ring was that we had a 20 year old, like living in a 30 year old's body. I mean, this kid looks like he's a full grown man. I mean, from his delts to his traps, I mean, the muscles on this kid's upper body and he wasn't skipping leg day either. Just really in good shape. And he was in soft. I mean, let's be honest, Fought a uh, a 41 year old Brazilian by way of New Hampshire. <laughs> Shout out to Box Red Gray and uh, Peter Simbor. But uh, you know he he was not 
in tough against uh, someone named Macon Da Silva. But that really wasn't what piqued my interest about what the future might hold for Trayvon Marshall. One, it was it was his his body, and then the other, once he, the fight started, was I just felt like he didn't do anything in the fight without starting with a jab or two jabs. I mean, fundamentally, he just looked so strong. And then the knockout, of course, was great. And if you saw the clip, it's on my timeline. It's on the um, uh, the PBC timeline on Twitter. I, I just retweeted theirs. But the the knockout was so good because uh, – not because – you know, it was a soft opponent, but the way he set up the uppercut knockout, I thought was just was just tremendous. I mean, that was he did a little filthy. slip. Yeah, it was nasty. He did a little slip. He was kind of in tight, but did what you know had had thrown had thrown both of his hands already. Did a little slip, and then just like anything in boxing, threw an uppercut that his opponent just had no idea was coming, and that was that was it. So it was. I think like I mean, if this was the Olympics, was you get assign like they would they rate you i guess like in gymnastics or something like you get assessed on your execution and the difficulty and i feel like we see lots of prospects go out there and they just smoke guys and they knock guys out and it's cool and all that stuff but this guy took like the high the high difficulty uh i I don't know what you call it like this was like the highest difficulty type of knockout that you could have scored it was like ridiculous that he was able to pull this off because you don't see guys get knocked out like this a lot like I mean, no. prospects knock dudes out all the time, but it's it's nothing that's like, wow, the the way that that was set up was very, <laughs> very impressive. I was impressed yeah. by that. I, I mean, I actually give him less credit, though, than I think you do for, for this win. I wouldn't have put him in graduation, but I mean, what do I know? You, we're talking about graduation from a certain level. I thought uh, one of the things about that card, though, it, it always entertains me in kind of like a... It's not good, but it all it's always really entertaining to me when I see like blatant fouls in the ring. Mm-hmm. And so we saw in the Kyron Davis, his opponent, McGregor, just threw a blatant elbow. Nasty. And I was just like, are you kidding me? You're on national TV right now. Like, why are you throwing an elbow? Yeah. And I love those Fox cards because the cameras they use are so unlike anything i'm usually watching so it's just so the high i don't know what those are that they use but the definition of them is just so beyond anything that you see otherwhere any other place in the sport and then to your point like (laughs) you know a super slow-mo is coming on that elbow (laughs) i mean you know fox is notorious for those super slow-mos going out to commercial on those shows it just i don't know what that guy i don't know what he was thinking he was not playing around in there that's what i know that um he the first guy to get caught in 8d or 8k oh it was dirty filthy and you know i i I, on the prospect on the trayvon marshall thing you know is he ready to graduate no but but i think this this section of our show is also kind of bleeding into starting to bleed into this this is someone you want to earmark and and make sure you want to see his next his next go as well so just for the record in real time i was like there's no way that there was a foul there and so i was even oh, I more know. blown away when they slowed it down. i was like oh he 100 percent did throw an elbow that was dirty oh not to I don't mean to agree with you. Agree with you on everything you say. It's probably better, I suppose, from a listener perspective. If we're always arguing with each other, but <laughs> but I said the same thing. I'm like, come on, this ref just took two points. Yeah, yeah. This is ridiculous, right? And then yeah, it's, they showed the replay, and I was like, oh shit, he went right at him with his elbow. Um, and then and then they showed. Um, and then I I lo- I thought back to when the ref was chastising him in the corner saying you just hit him with your elbow and he looked guilty as hell i mean <laughs> he knew what he did and he didn't even try to argue it so it would have been funny if he uh, did though he'd be like i didn't do that and then and then fox cuts to slow <laughs> it's like actually uh, he did <laughs> yeah wouldn't be the first time would it Time for our weekly Road Warrior segment. 
who's getting this back in the ring. That was spectacular. All right, so normally we would highlight, we would do one of two things, if not both. We'd highlight someone that's a grizzled veteran that maybe shouldn't be fighting but still is, and there really isn't anyone jumping off the page as of Tuesday on BoxRec. So, but we always want to make sure we highlight our, the road warriors that mostly in the UK, but not always, Keep the foundation of our sport running. So I'm not going to go deep, but let me mention four guys. 29-year-old Daryl Sharp. Shout out to, to you, Daryl. Five wins, 74 losses, one draw. Only one of those 74 losses by knockout. He's a light heavyweight fighting on Frank Warren's show Friday. And he's fighting 20-year-old Carol Atuama, who's 3-0. and And sorry, Carol, I probably just butchered your name. Carol won a gold at the Youth Olympics for England. So Daryl Sharp in really, really tough there Friday. And then one of my absolute favorites, same show, Kevin McCauley, 41 years old. Kevin's record is 15 wins, 210 losses, and 12 draws. Only 14 of those 212, 210 losses by knockout. He takes on 25-year-old Jonathan Kumiet. Kumu Teo. Sorry, Jonathan, I know I just killed your name, too. He's won and all. He won a uh, London ABA championship as an amateur, so he can clearly fight, and he's going to need to, going up against uh, my guy Kevin McCauley with almost 250 pro fights. Unbelievable. And then on Saturday over in Nottinghamshire, UK, we have, actually, I think that's Friday, Michael Mad Max Mooney, nine wins, 75 losses in two draws, only seven knockouts. He's only been knocked out seven times. Faces Declan McManus, making his pro debut. Now, I couldn't find a ton of information by De- about Declan McManus. He wa- is a decorated amateur, I know that, and was initially signed on to be trained by David Allen. I'm not sure if he still is or not. No, David Allen was really high on him. And then last but not least, light welterweight Kasim Hussein. Four wins, 104 losses, and two draws. Only two of his losses by knockout. Faces Connor Irison, 5-0, on a Carl Greaves promotion in the UK on set. Oh, whoops. <laughs> the music just kept playing. <laughs> hit, hit, hit the music. <laughs> so that's it oh. for our Road Warriors. I, I mean, the, the music that played was this song. It, it immediately went into this song. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> Drowning pool. That's that's uh that we'll we'll play that uh whenever it's like oh yeah big punch is back. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Drowning Pool. Everyone knows Drowning Pool. Plenty of fighters have come into that over the years. So. Uh, that, I feel like that song was like super popular at one point and it just kind of fell out. What happened? Yeah, I don't know. It lives in infamy, though. Uh, all right. So you have like two minutes and 40 seconds for this segment now to fit the full song in. So you'll have to condense a little bit going forward. So you end when the music ends. <laughs> right. Okay. 240. I've got it. <laughs> I will. I'll, I'll practice that next time. Little production. Uh, live production. I like it. It turned off. It turned out great. All right. Um, what do we have coming up this coming week? that you're going to be watching. Yeah. So what I'll be watching, just highlight a handful of things. We're not going to go anything too deep except the last one. And so we have a big event Friday afternoon in France. This may kind of bleed into uh, mainstream boxing folks because uh, heavyweight Tony Yoka, 10 and 0 Olympic gold medalist, Frenchman fighting on top of the card against Peter Malas probably butchering Peter's name, but he's a Croatian, 15 and 0, 11 knockouts. And uh, this is a pretty good, this is a pretty good step up for Yoka. I'm really interested to see this main event. The undercard should be pretty good too. There's a, a, pr- a pretty good show. I think that'll probably end up being three or four fights live and it's being broadcast on ESPN plus in the States and uh canal plus in France. What do you think of Tony Yoka, by the way? He's okay. I think yeah, he really stunted any sort of his development when he got banned in France from fighting for a little while. I think yeah. he's obviously got some power. He's a big dude, but like he 
I feel like it really crushed his momentum. He's got a lot of catching up to do in order to get into the conversation with the with the guys at the top. I mean, like, you look at a, a guy like Joe Joyce. He's, like, miles ahead of where Tony Yoka is. And I'm sure, well, I guess what we could say is that Tony Yoka is still very young, so he's got time. Heavyweight is yep. one of those divisions where you can be old and still be good. So he's in Only no 29. rush, I think. Wait, yep. he's 29 already? He's 29, yeah. Man, time is going fast. Yep. Huge guy. 6'7". Really can box. Hard to tell if he's really got the power and, and really the ability to step to the next level with that power to take some of these big guys out or if he'll just be someone that can rack up wins but doesn't really bring eyeballs to the TV. Just, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's early. Yeah, I think... It, it is still early, and he's still in the development phase. <clears throat> okay. Friday. There's some other stuff going on Friday, but the other thing I'll be watching Friday is it's time for BKFC 21, the Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship from Omaha. Is Paige Van Zant fighting again? <laughs> no, not yet. She's still they, training, though. They she's keep her the pretty gym. active. That's why I asked. I was like, dang, every time I hear about BKFC, she's fighting. No, sadly, no females on this show, at least as listed on Box Rec. Right, and I'm that's why I, I, <laughs> that's why I, li- I, you know, that's why I just briefly mentioned it on our show, and I put it on my stands of live streaming schedule, and I don't put other things on my stands stands of live streaming schedule because this is listed on Box Rec, you know. So, um, we'll see how that goes. But that's what I'll be watching Friday night. So there's Friday. Saturday, we've got, we'll be broadcast on saturday about 11 a.m u.s eastern daylight time on about a six hour delay this uh this card will probably go off about 3 a.m in the east east coast and it's on g plus in japan and it should be pretty easy for me to stay dark on the results of this so i'm going to watch it and pretend it's live on saturday morning about 10 11 a.m We've got Japanese flyweight title up for grabs. Former youth uh, junior flyweight champion and touted Japanese prospect Rikido Shiba is 4-1. He faces Shokichi Iwata, who's 6-0, and and a great chief support on this one. Yuki Nagano, 18-3 versus Yuki Beppo, 21-2-1 at welterweight. So the top two fights on this card... And the cards has a, a time block on G plus in uh, Japan for four hours. So it'll be a great show. I love Japanese boxing. So this is going to be a great afternoon for me on Saturday. There's some ways to watch uh, G plus. So if I can help you do that, let me know, but it won't be in uh, links won't be available in my live streaming schedule because the only real way to watch it would be to have a subscription to a Japanese internet protocol TV subscription site, which um, are kind of hard to get your hands on. So let me know if I can help you. So there is my Saturday afternoon and to have Japan on a Saturday afternoon and not have to wake up at three in the morning for it is just makes my whole day. So this is great. And then early Saturday morning in the East Coast, live and free on YouTube on like a 1080p crystal clear HD stream, probably about 7, 8 a.m. Eastern time. And the link will be in Stanza and my, on my social media bios. We have a huge show from uh, Ekaterinburg, Russia, from RCC Promotions. And amongst hardcore boxing fans across social media s- sphere, RCC Promotions is a favorite. They usually put on a really good show, really well-matched fights, a lot of action and excitement. Once in a while, we'll get a dud show out of them, but it's not, you don't labor through their shows. It's a fun watch. So if you're if you're up early on a Saturday morning and, and turn on YouTube, just follow my link. I think you'll enjoy it. The co-feature is one that I'm really looking forward to. Olympic gold medalist Evgeny Tachenko is a cruiserweight and he's coming off his first career defeat, which is really a shocker back in uh, March, losing to South African Thabiso Machunu 
in a clear unanimous decision 12 victory in uh, Tachenko's backyard. Really a surprise there. And Tachenko is fighting every hardcore boxing fan's favorite, Dmitry Kudryashov. Kudry, Kudryashov. I'm sorry. By now you should know I'm terrible at, at spelling, at pronouncing names. And I do put work into it, which is what's frustrating for me. So I apologize. Kudryashov, of course, is all or nothing. And this guy is either going to get knocked out or knock out. And at 35, maybe well past his prime, considering the wars he's been through. But just this past May, he was in a Bridgerweight title fight with Evgeny Romanov, who at the time was 15-0. and In a bout that was really supposed to be a war. I know hardcore boxing fears were really looking forward to it. It didn't play out that way. Went a full 12 rounds. And Kudryashov just didn't look like he could let his hands go anymore. But Tuchenko is a big, huge cruiserweight and always been a little, a little chinny, little, just kind of loose on his legs. So a little chinny think, is being very generous. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah. Every punch looks like it might knock him over. Same so. with his punches to other people. <laughs> so yeah, that's why this, this fight is just, it's fascinating. And this fight in particular will probably go off somewhere around the two, three o'clock Eastern time in the U S uh, this is on a YouTube. great fight. In fact, the whole card is really good, but this is a great fight. It, it, yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's going to be a, a good fight. I think you will get entertained, but in terms of what, like the stakes here, like Kujashov is clearly past the expiration point, I think. And yep. Tishchenko just <clears throat> never put it together. He got a gold at the Olympics with a horrible decision over Vasily Levitt. And then, mm -hmm. Just in very predictable fashion, with the benefit of hindsight, lost to Mishunu, which have, like if you now look back at it, it's like, oh yeah, he was always gonna lose that fight. But yep. now it's like basically he's just like rolling the dice, like, all right, well, I mean, if I can't beat Kujiashov, I guess I'll quit. Well, uh, yeah, that's exactly the point for this fight, isn't it? Like, uh, I mean, if you're his camp, if you're Tashenko's camp, and they offer they offer Kujiashov to you. If I'm his man, if I'm Tashenko's manager, I'm saying, Jesus, I mean, if we can't be beat this guy. What the hell are we doing? So, yeah, I mean, but still, there's enough danger there for it to be. <laughs> I think it's going to be fun to watch. Um, hey, we're up against the time. We have we have our guests joining us soon. So let me just mention, though, you said this whole card is um, is good top to bottom. And it is because we've got a really exciting prospect, a super featherweight, Mark Irvanoff, who, of course, goes by the name Canelo because he's got red hair. Obviously. Uh, Faces a, a, a pretty skilled Nigerian named Otto Joseph, who's 17 and 0. And Irvanov is 25 and he's on a six fight winning streak. And 17, 2 and 1, I think, is his record, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. But a really, really exciting young kid. And he's got some highlight real knockouts uh, to his credit. So I'm really looking forward to that bout. And then the main event is former. Devin Haney victim, Zaru Abdullayev, 13 and 1, fighting someone named Dijon Zlatkanyan. Okay, 24 so I just, just want to say here, just to like correct things a little bit. You okay, called Abdullayev a victim of Devin Haney. Correct, I did. When it's actually more appropriate to call Zlatikanin or Zatichin or whatever, however they say it, a victim. Because he is the guy that Mikey Garcia just detached from his senses <laughs> on the it's undercard right. of Frampton Santa Cruz, too. Yep. Abdul I right also catch. got stopped, by the way, just so we're sure. But this is an amazing fight. And it's for a yeah. WBC silverweight title. So somebody's getting a title shot in the near future. Yes. Apparently this, by winning this silver, you are in number one position for... This is basically a number one eliminator, essentially, for Haney's, Haney's belt. It's impossible to not be excited for this. Yeah. Should be a great card, man. You know, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot about Mikey Garcia. And then our we guy, all have. It's been a while. Zalata <laughs> Kinnan, the Montenegro fighter. He's got some damn nice wins on his record, man. He beat Ivan Redcatch when Redcatch was 18-0. Beat, beat Ricky Burns. 
Ricky Burns. Yep. Ricky Burns was a flash in the pan back in the day. Wow. Wow. That was a completely unnecessary shot you took there, Tim. I mean, that's what he was, right? He's like a four division champion. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> so that leads us right into our guest, right, Angelo? <laughs> yeah. We are now going to welcome on our guest. Which, I I like how you put a couple of things here, so I'm just going to say them for you, Tim. Uh, you put BYB Extreme Saturday Evening, which I'm guessing stands for Backyard Boxing. No! <laughs> that, that, it has so to stand for Backyard Saturday, Boxing. Let me just hijack this real quick before we get to Shane Shapiro. We have BYB Extreme, which is bare knuckle fighting in the Mighty Trigon Saturday Bring night. Bring your own boxing gloves. The Mighty Trigon has a knockout percentage, Angelo, I might mention to you, of 90%. Okay, so this... we're not getting decisions in the Mighty Trigon. That ring is made like a triangle, dude. We're Wait. getting knockouts. Oh, boy. We're going to have to talk about this after, because if this is what I think it is, uh, I need to message Corey immediately. And then, and then Saturday afternoon from the UK, BKB, Bare Knuckle Boxing. We've got three bare, high-level Bare Knuckle events, and that's not even talking about the Russian stuff that you scrape the bottom of the barrel for. So it's a busy bare knuckle weekend. <laughs> right. I scraped the bottom of the barrel with the Russian card, but yeah. uh, this is high level bare knuckle. Great. No, 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 no. Russian bare knuckle. Scrape the oh. bottom of the barrel with the Russian bare knuckle. Yeah. Oh, see, see guys, I, I, we just need to do a full podcast. You, Corey, just talk about all this bare knuckle stuff so we can get this all out there, but we'll discuss our, uh, our business moves at a later time, because right now we have to welcome on our guests. We now welcome on the president of Shapiro Sports and Entertainment, Shane Shapiro. Hey, Shane. Thanks for joining I, the Tim Boxdale Show. Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys. I've been a big fan for a while, and um, I've had a little correspondence with Timmy, and we've had a few mutual friends, and um, just been a huge, huge, huge fan of the, the work that you guys do, because it's 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 super easy to report boxing and all the big fights that are going on, but to really report the club shows that are going on all around the world takes a lot of um, not only dedication, but love for the sport. So I have a lot of respect for, for what you guys are doing, and it's an honor for me to be on your guys' show. Thanks. We appreciate that. Um, I'm sure, Tim, you do too, but I guess I'll just speak for you. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Shane. No, it's a it's a pleasure. And I, I, first, I first saw your your name and and this is a uh, you know not not for for me to get necessarily give a comment uh, a compliment right back to you but I'm going to is that I was interested if there was any manager and I know you, you're going to tell us a little bit more about where you're headed now with your career but spent a long time as as a manager and I was curious if there was any managers that try to focus on areas of the country that I try to watch boxing in and, you know, I had made friends with Mike Altamura, who's been on my Patreon podcast. And, the best. One of the best. Yeah, the best. The best. Mike is a, w one of the best guys ever. And and I know he does that. But so I'm Googling, you know, like a like a knucklehead, box, you know, boxing managers and then putting weird countries behind it. And your name was like one of the first ones to pop up. So, like, oh, this is this is great. Shane and I share a lot of the same interests. So I was excited to have you on and. And for you to share the, some of those with us. So Absolutely. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, what, you know, for those that may be unfamiliar, just tell us a little bit kind of about yourself. And, and yeah, you so I'll give you a little brief introduction, how I got into boxing. It's a long story, but I'll make it brief because I know that um, our time is limited. But I um, when I was in high school, I was a standout baseball player. Um, I was a starting catcher for my high school team as a freshman. So I played varsity four years. And that was my path in life. Baseball still is my true love. Um, it was number one in my life. I always loved boxing as a second um, sport that, you know, I'm also a diehard Lakers fan because I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. Still live there for people that are not familiar with me. But um, Dodgers, that was the yeah, Dodgers. Okay. Diehard, actually, I was All just right. watching them in the background yep. right before we came on. Yep. So, All right. Um, We're friends. Diehard, diehard Dodger fan went to the last couple World Series. Um, but back to boxing. So. I thought that was my path. I was going to play baseball and I actually was blessed to have a couple of scholarship opportunities come up and heading into my senior year of high school. Um, I was sky 
sky high on the world. I was feeling like I was invincible. Everything was going my way. And then out of nowhere, uh, I went for a physical to my doctor. And on my 18th birthday, right before my 18th birthday, um, the doctor diagnosed me with thyroid cancer, which came out of complete nowhere. I had zero symptoms. And um, as an 18-year-old to get thyroid cancer, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with it. It's a really, really rare form of cancer in teens. So it's one in three million. So that at the time threw a huge wrench in my plans as far as where I was going in life. Um, I wasn't able to play baseball in college. I finished up my senior year, but after that, um, baseball wasn't an option for me anymore. So um, I always try to figure out a way to still be involved with sports and, you know, being an agent in baseball and in basketball, which um, is a little bit harder than, than getting into a sport like boxing. So for me, um, kind of to touch on Tim's point of how I got into the sport being a young manager, my way into the game was by um, managing a fighter by the name of Chem Killix. And he was um, an amateur in Germany who fought for the, for the Turkish national team. And he was just here on vacation, just visiting L.A. And um, we happened to be at the same place at the same time. And um, we connected without really ever meeting each other. And he was just like, yeah, you know, I'm looking to turn pro here in America. And I'm looking for someone to give me a chance. And, you know, I said to him, you know, you know, I never met you here. But, you know, if, if, if you're serious about coming here, you know, I'll, I'll give you a chance. And. Basically, one thing led to another. He went back to Germany. We had we talked over WhatsApp for like a whole year at that time. I was helping a couple of local amateur fighters, just going to tournaments, getting them their pass books, um, kind of just learning the game as a little bit more than just a fan and um, convinced Chem to move out here a year later. And we got a, uh, a, a, a two bedroom apartment and he basically I, I gave him a place to stay and we took him I took him to the wild card gym, like most people, you know, with never, ever stepping foot there, not knowing Freddie Roach, um, and basically just said, Hey, Freddie, you know, I have a guy that I just, I'm really, really high on. And I would like, you know, maybe you could take a look at him. And, um, the next day he said, he said to us, show up at one o'clock tomorrow. So we showed up the next day and the next day Chem was sparring with Miguel Cotto. And it was like in that moment, guys, where I was just like, wow, I'm not a fan anymore. I'm really in this game. I'm, I'm involved. So that's kind of a quick little intro of how I got into boxing. Um, and you guys can follow up. Well, I mean, what was that like when you walk in the gym? Miguel Cotto is the one who's in the ring. You're like, Whoa. I mean, Cotto was <laughs> one of my favorite fighters growing up. Um, I was a big, big Cotto fan, big Shane Mosley fan. Um, I, I, the nineties were like, you know, I, I was like the great era for me. Um, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. My fighter all of a sudden that just a couple months ago just moved here is now sparring with Miguel Cotto and, you know, HBO 24 sevens in there. And it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And then the next day, Mike Tyson happened to be there watching sparring. And I'm like pinching myself. Like, you know, this is, uh, this, uh, this would never, ever happen. This would never, ever happen. So that it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. So, um, what year was that? That was in 2015, May of 2015. I was with, we were at the Wild Card Gym for about three years. We, we sparred with, we helped Miguel Cotto for a few camps. We helped Manny for a camp. We helped, um, we helped uh, John Pascal for his fight against Kovalev. Um, so we did a couple of camps at the Wild Card with Freddie and had a great experience there. And for me as a young manager, you know, being being around Freddie and learning the business and having Bruce Trampler walk in and just being around all those big names right away, um, in a way it benefited me and in a lot of ways it also um, kind of hurt me because a lot of people were like, "Wow, who's this new kid coming into the game?" You know, um, people wanted to know a little bit more about who I was before they just kind of like opened up their their doors and their connections to me. Yeah, I do. Do you feel like? Um, well, I mean. I, there's two questions I have. Like the first is, did you struggle at all at the beginning of like, kind of like the imposter syndrome syndrome of like, I like you just didn't feel, even though you were clearly now at the table, didn't feel like you had that sort of gravitas to actually be at the table. 
so yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I really did not realize what I walked into. Um, you know, everyone you hear the, Oh yeah. Boxing so dirty, boxing so hard. It's a tough industry, but you know, people would ask me because, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I went to college, you know, I'm currently in law school and, 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 I come from a really, really good, you know, family. People were asking me, you know, like, why are you going into boxing? Why, why, why? And all my friends, um, it's, it's a great question because at, at the beginning, no one, no one opened their arms to, to me. Besides Freddie in the beginning, the first four fights, no one would get us a fight. Everyone was just like, oh, I would send people emails and I'm not going to name drop, but I would send all the big name promoters emails. Hey, I have this fighter, um, can you, can you take a look at him? Can you, can someone even respond to me? And then luckily our first four fights were with top rank. And when I was, you know, having to fill out forms for the commission or just even walking to the ring, I didn't really realize how much I was involved in the game. And it was a huge, huge learning curve for me being 19 years old at the time. I was 19 and I, I was a baby. I was a kid, you know, looking back at it now, I'm full 10 years later about, and, um, yeah, I mean, I was in complete shell shock, just like, you know, being on the undercard of someone like Tyson Fury and we're walking out in MGM grand and I'm just like, wow, I'm a boxing manager now. This is crazy. This is crazy. Yeah. hundred percent. There's many times where, um, having negotiations or, you know, being around Bob Arum and, you know, it's just like, wow, I'm really, really into this now. Yeah. I, I imagine that I think for most of us, I, I certainly feel like I would feel that if I walk in to the room and I'm like, Oh yeah. And now you're expected to negotiate with a guy who's been doing this his entire life. And, and, and you're walking into a fighter meeting and you're talking to now Andre Ward, who was one of your favorite fighters, Timothy Bradley, who I've been to five or six of his fights at the stub hub. Um, and you're just like, wow, these were people that I watched on TV, not idolizing because they weren't my heroes, but just like, wow, these are like the people that I'm watching and I'm such a fan of them. And now I'm sitting across from them. It was really, really incredible for me. And, um, you know, for someone that, that, that had no footing into the game, um, to, 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 to get to where I've gotten 10 years later, as far as we'll touch on, you know, certain fighters and stuff that I've worked on with. And I, I, I it's, it's, it's amazing to look back and see, wow. Um, how did I feel in those moments compared to now? And even now, um, I still feel the same way when we have a fight. I still feel the same way I felt back then. What was like your first big lesson that you learned? Never fall in love with a fighter. <laughs> that's that's the number one lesson that I learned. Never fall in love with a fighter. Um, hmm. Fighters fighters are, are really, 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 really good at... Um, at what they do, at what they do. And, and I think that anytime you fall in love with one fighter, your emotions can get involved. And, you know, um, fighters sometimes, you know, they're their own worst enemy. And sometimes they want to do what they think is, is best for them. And it's not necessarily the best move for their career. So, um, you know, I think that I learned that the hard way um, by getting really, really close to fighters and making them you know, like my family and, and becoming really, really close, close to a lot of my fighters in the beginning. And then realizing later that, you know, this is a business. It isn't personal. And I made certain relationships personal. And I just learned early on that this is a business for a lot of people. And to be successful, a lot of these promoters are able to have a, a, a conscious where they are able to just know what they're getting away with. And for me, I struggle with that constantly, you know, um, it, it, I have a lot of respect for what the fighters do. And I think sometimes, you know, the biggest issue is that they don't understand the business and it's, it's a lot of risk for a lot of people involved. And I learned that really, really early by, um, falling in love with fighters that I necessarily shouldn't have been involved with, but because they had a name or because, you know, it sounded good. I just went for it. So I, I became a sucker for that kind of early on. What a tightrope to walk, though, because like you said, with with Chem and a, a, as an example, you know, you guys are are living together. Right. And and I mean, 
we lived together for you, six years. Now you know, we don't live together anymore. But yeah, I mean, I, I to this day, that kid's still a brother to me. So I'm not talking. I'm not referencing Chem. Anyone listening? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, I know. Absolutely. Yeah, I put. Yeah, I put those words in your mouth. Sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to draw that. No, 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 that no. parallel. Go for but it. But what I'm saying. Yeah, no, no, no. So what I'm saying is like, I've never managed a fighter, but I would imagine it's. Nor do I want to. But yeah, <laughs> I imagine it's. <laughs> I imagine it's just almost to the level of babysitting so so you hit it on the nail so you how do you gosh I, you're walking a tightrope there then, so aren't you? i you hit it on the nail you hit it on the nail you're not really a manager you're more of a babysitter so you're making sure like so chem when he moved he, pretty much the whole time he was with me um because you know now he's living on his own and you know after he's gotten a couple of good fights um he was with me for a while so he didn't drive so we went to the gym every day together i worked his corner during sparring after sparring was over, we would be going home together. We'd be at home together, then strength and conditioning. I'm taking him. So we were together 24-7, 365 for six years. And, you know, you and you know, he's around my family, he's at family dinners, him and my sister, you know, brother and sister at some point. You know, it's just it, that's that's a lesson for me that I had to learn as far in the sense that like this is someone that I love to death outside of the ring, but inside of the ring, you have to put your emotions aside. And there's been so many Chem fights um, where he's is in wars, wars. And my heart, heart tells me one thing. And then my mind tells me one thing. And it was, it's like you said, a very, very fine line. And, you know, I think in boxing more than in other sports, there's not a lot of transparency and you have to really dig into find it. There's, it's easy to find a fighter that's 15 and 0, but why is he 15 and 0? And why isn't anyone wanting to work with him? So there, mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that I think that that you like you said you have to you have to you have to walk a fine line and establish like okay, you're my my client, you're my brother. No, 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 no. You're you're my client. You know that's just how it has to be. So I, I learned that. I learned that. So you were kind of transitioning, I guess, because you started as a manager. Yep. But then you're listed on BoxRec as like a promoter. Yep. Yep. So I managed for nine years Mm -hmm. and I I managed Chem and I now I promote him. I had um, Calvin Henderson, who I took from pro debut all the way to 12 and 0. Um, I worked with Mason Menard for a little bit, Um, got him, you know, fights with Teofimo and Devin Haney. Uh, I worked with Mike Lee for a little bit. I worked with Ahmed El Viali for a little bit. Um, I worked with Clarence Booth for a little bit. So I got a lot of, uh, I also worked with a couple of Kazakhstan fighters. Um, so I was managing a bunch of different fighters, just kind of gaining experience, getting on Showtime, getting on ESPN, you know, working with different promoters and, and, you know, you guys would appreciate this, but like, you know, we were going to, I was going to down to Tijuana and doing those shows and getting my guys wins. I was going to like me and Tim were talking about, um, we were going to shows in Hinkley, Minnesota. We did five or six fights there i mean going into little little places all over the country just to get that experience of you know what it's like you know you're not just going to fight an mgm brand every single time you're not going to fight at staples every time you know it's not going to be like that you know so i i I was using my years as a manager to really gain experience on the fighters end and what it's like to negotiate on their behalf i also was in the gym every single day and i'll you know we we we, I, i was blessed to be around freddie for a few years Chem was also a main sparring partner for Errol Spence, um, Jamar, Jamar, Jermel Charlo. Uh, so I was with Derek James for a year. Um, we spent a lot of time with Buddy McGirt. Um, so we were, I, I've been so blessed, guys, to be honest, to be around such great um, teachers in this game. So I gained so much experience during that time of management that, you know, I, we had, you know, I, I, I had more losses than I did wins in the sense of fights, um, as far as the big, big fights. Um, but I gained so much experience and friendships during those times that about a year ago, just, just about right before COVID started, I had my mind made up, um, you know, cause I recently uh, was telling Tim started law school, um, for the very simple reason that, you know, this game requires a lot, a lot of dealings with contracts and immigration. So I knew that me being a a, a pretty much a part-time full-time law student. Um, I wouldn't be able to do the babysitting and I don't really want to do the babysitting anymore. So about 
a year and a half ago, um, I transitioned full time to promoting and in promoting, I'm got about 10 to 15 fighters that I promote currently that are basically all around the world. Not very many Americans. Um, and now I'm just building guys up and bringing them to the America to America when the right time comes. And, um, so I'm serving more, not so much of as a booking agent or anything, but I'm promoting guys that I really, really have an eye and eye on out for. And, um, that's where I'm at. I'm more of a promoter now. And I'm going to eventually, once COVID stops, um, do a couple shows here locally in Los Angeles at some point. So I kind of transitioned away from management as, as you mentioned, um, and used all that experience and connections and all that. And now I'm, I'm promoting full time. So that's where I'm at. So, I mean, I, I guess you, you kind of answered the question cause I was curious, like, well, what was the moment that you realize, all right, enough managing time to go into promotion, but I guess we can kind of, I can answer, I can answer that exact moment. For okay. You too. I can. So put us there. Uh, oh, I'm going to put you right there. It was, a, it was hard. It was hard. It was like one of my worst, worst moments in boxing where I was ready to be done. I was ready to be done. And, um, you know, right before Chem's fight, we were number four in the WBA and I had a really, really, really good feeling going into the Steven Nelson fight that this was going to be our breakthrough moment. Um, and at that time, Chem was pretty much Chem and Calvin were pretty much the only two I had worked with. I was working with because I had trimmed down my roster based on how much money it was costing for camps. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to focus on these two. Chem's number four in the world. He's really, really close. And if he makes it, we're going to blow up and that's going to be it for me. So I was so confident. I was so confident. And that's another lesson I learned. And, you know, I've made a couple big, big mistakes in this game. And I can answer those questions, too, because there's some funny ones. But I felt so good. I felt so confident. I thought this was it. So when we lost that fight, um, I was wrecked. I was wrecked. I was almost in shock. I couldn't believe we lost. Um, And I just said, you know, I, I can't put my faith. And, 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 you know, cause I, I did so much hard work getting Chem to that point at number four. So it was such a devastating loss and fighters lose and it happens. You don't always have your best night, but for me personally, it felt like I had suffered such a personal loss. And I just said to myself in that moment that, you know, management, as far as the every single day, I, I don't know if I'm emotionally capable of doing that again. So, um, it was that moment right there, honestly, for like a month, for like a month, two months. I was just like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And, you know, boxing is such an addicting um, – it's a, it's, a, it's a drug because like I was explaining to Tim, the reason, you know, I'm in boxing, of course, I you know, I want to make a living for myself. But I love giving opportunities to people and seeing their stories succeed and giving people who would never, ever get a chance just an opportunity – that is more success. That's more of a successful feeling and, and satisfactory feeling to me than 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 anything else. Like getting a, an Olympian and taking him to the top. That's what really really brought me back. But it was that moment after Chem's fight where I was like, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to do this anymore. So now with the transition between being a manager and a promoter, for anybody that's like unclear on what those distinctions are, what it, how how does life change for you? Okay, so I'll explain it pretty simply. Like the management role, you're really, um, you're responsible for you know getting the fighter a trainer, making sure that his camps are good, he has a place to stay, he's got food. Um, you know, you're 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 constantly looking out for the fighter nonstop and always making sure that they're okay. And it's like 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 you guys mentioned, it's 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 a part time babysitting job, but it's also you know you're constantly strategically placing where what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? So now as a promoter, I'm not so much doing the babysitting, but I am on the promotional end of getting the fighter a fight, getting them the right exposure, um, using my mouthpiece, which I'm sure you guys figured out. (laughs) I I can talk forever. Um, it really, really like promoting the fighter, you know, um, getting them out in articles, getting people talking about them, getting them on TV, um, buying them, you're, you're paying for their fights. The promoter is res- financially responsible for getting the fighters, the fights. So, um, I've kind of gotten rid of the babysitting responsibilities and the management day-to-day stuff. And now I'm more strategically, um, getting guys fights. 
and getting them through the rankings, stuff like that. And do, are the managerial clients that you had, are those guys who have come along with you for the ride and now are going to be part of your promotional stable? So that's a great question. No. So Chem was the only one that, 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 that was with me. Um, I had to make some decisions regarding certain other guys that, you know, it just wasn't going to make sense because to answer your question, honestly, like management, I'm not responsible for paying them. I'm responsible for getting them their fights. And so now me being a promoter, I have a financial responsibility to guarantee certain people fights. So as I transitioned to the promotional realm, I, um, became very, very selective as far as what I was going to start out with because I didn't want to take on more than I can chew. So my first signings as a promoter was three Cuban prospects. Um, Yoelvis Gomez, whose father, he's he's currently 4-0 right now. We've talked about uh, him before. Yeah, he's he's incredible. He's incredible, and I'd love to touch on him because I'm so, so high on him. Um, his dad, Jose Gomez, was a gold medalist for, for Cuba. Um, so we have him. I signed him. Uh, Giovanni Bruzon, who's a heavyweight from from Cuba, and then also Lenier Perot from from Cuba. So those were my first three signings um, as a promoter, and um, they're guys that were really high, high blue chip amateurs. So I felt like going into my promotional side, like that was a great start for me as far as building my stable. So um, I signed those three guys, and then. I started, I always had a very, very strong connection um, with some of my partners in Germany or Universum. Um, and just recently we, we started um, a co-promotional deal for us with Christian Toon, who a guy I'm really, really, really high on. So um, I used some of my connections in foreign markets to build up my, my stable and then um, another thing uh, that we did was, um, I connected with someone who I've been friends with a long time, Sean Gibbons, and we signed, uh, with also his son, uh, Brendan, who's a good friend of mine and my partner. Um, we signed Jack Tapora, 23 and one fought for a world title was W I think WBA actually interim titleist. And he was only lost was to Oscar Escondone. So we, we signed him co-promotional together. And we're just getting Jack a win in the Philippines coming up. And then we're going to be um, bringing him back here for, for a big fight. Um, so I did that. And then also I signed three fighters from, from Venezuela. Um, uh, John Aker to Tovar, who's 19-0 uh, uh, now. Uh, Dervin Rodriguez, who's 9-0. and And then um, Fratimil Macayo, who's 15-1. Uh, and so I've kind of in the last year slowly built up my stable to what it is now. And right now I got about 12 or 13 guys. So did you have to go down to like Venezuela and scout basically to, to find these guys or did somebody bring them to you? Did you, did you heard the whispers? So did Tim talk uh, about them. So, so no, no, t Tim, no, t unfortunately, no. Tim has <laughs> me and, me and Tim. T T Tim must be with some other promoter. Some other promoter must have Tim in their pockets because I, I I haven't gotten those conversations yet. But um, <laughs> Tim's holding out on you. Th that's something that's going to have to be discussed later. Thanks for bringing that up. But um, no, um, <laughs> no, um, I've ha I've made some really really good connections in some of these places. So in 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 Mexico, um, I have a good friend named James Gog who um, happened to live in Colombia for a few years and he's trained a lot of these guys. And James has been around for forever, forever. And he's like, um, you know, got so much knowledge. So he had reached out to me when I, I reached out to certain people like him, Sean Givens, um, my friend Flavio in Germany was with Universum and a couple other people. Um, my mentor, Mike Borreo, I got to, I got to mention him or else he'll kill me. Um, guys who, who I've trusted for a long, Mike Altamora, guys like that, who I've known for a while. Um, and trusted their eye for talent. And then, you know, I, 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 I watch a lot of boxing, you know, I watch a lot of boxing. I don't miss show. I don't watch club as many club shows as you guys do, but I'm a homebody that loves to watch sports. So any reason that I have to stay home and watch boxing, I, I, I do, I do. So a lot of these guys that people told me about, some of them I already had heard about. And some of these guys I'd never heard about. So 
you know, it's whether it's making certain calls to people that got a great eye for talent and saying, hey, what have you heard about this guy? What do you think about this guy? Um, I haven't been to Venezuela for for scouting. I've been to Mexico before. Like I mentioned I've been to Germany before. Um, so, you know, hopefully once COVID opens up, I'm going to start going back to some of these places and really creating the infrastructure there. But, um, yeah, to answer your question, I've 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 scouted a lot of these guys based on the eye for talent and the connections that I have. So Shane, what is with all these different locations, what is, I mean, what is the biggest challenge of working with fighters from, I guess what you could only call remote locations? Um, to be honest, I don't think it is a challenge. I think it's more of an advantage because these guys from most of these countries are really, really hungry people and they have nothing to fight for but their lives. And I don't want to criticize American fighters or, you know, English fighters or anything, but in some of these countries like in Colombia or Venezuela or in Mexico or even in Germany, there's parts of Germany that are really, really bad. Like these guys don't ask the same questions that U.S. fighters ask and they don't ask what's my signing bonus. They don't ask you, you know, what clothes, this and that. They just want to know when they're fighting and, and and just to feed their families or put food on the table. And that's what I think I love more about working with guys from those remote locations. Um, what some of the challenges are, are language. Um, I speak Spanish, so that works to my advantage with those kind of countries. Um, a disadvantage, you know, is, you know, you don't necessarily have someone on the ground all the time that is able to do the things that you're able to do here when, you know, if I have a problem with someone here or if there's an issue at the gym, I just go right there and, and take care of it. Or, you know, in other countries, sometimes you're dealing with the time zone. Sometimes you're dealing, like I said, with, with different languages. Um, so that's, that's one of the challenges I'd say for sure is, and also um, that's kind of one of the main reasons why I went to law school is, is the immigration, you know, with the immigration to get guys into the States and this and that it, Sometimes becomes really, really big, a big headache. Angela, I'm glad I just sit in my boxer shirts and watch boxing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like enough for me. Um, Shane, um, I said this, I said the exact same thing to Altamura and Mike Altamura, and I, I, I mean it with complete sincerity. Is there's got to be like a part one, two, and three because we could talk for the next hour. Oh, for sure. But I wanted to, uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to talk about maybe two fighters you're working with that you'd like to highlight and, 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 and talk more about. And I'd like to preempt my own question by saying, can you please talk about you Elvis Gomez? Cause oh. we, we were talking about him. I can't believe that, that he, that's not that I can't believe it, but I didn't know, you know, I had no idea who he was signed to or whatever. I'm just, I'm, I'm really high on him, and I'd, I'd love to hear about him. Sure, sure. And then I'll leave you guys with one funny story, what was one of my biggest like mistakes that happened to me in boxing. And I'll make it quick, I promise. Um, Yo no, Elvis, no worries. Yo Elvis is co-promoted with me, uh, my partner Aldo Mir at Warriors Boxing. Uh, at my boxing Major League, sorry, let me correct that. He's Cuban. He um, he was a big part in taking Yo Elvis out of Cuba. So he was huge, huge. Um and um, Louis DeCubis and Leon at Warriors. So we co-promote the three of us together with Yo Elvis. Yo Elvis is in Mexico now. He's supposed to be here in the USA, hopefully by the end of this month, which gets me so excited. And he'll hopefully begin training with Ismael Salas. Um, Yo Elvis is 4-0, or yeah, I think he's 4-0, you sure? Yep. Um, and if you look at him fighting, he fights like someone who's 14 or 15-0, and and he had so many wins in the amateurs. Him and David Morrell were one and two. So in Cuba, I don't know. Um, most people, most people know they only choose one te- one person for the team. So usually number two and three, who are tremendous fighters, don't even make it. So a guy like Gomez um, <laughs> got through, and uh, no one really heard about him too much coming out of Cuba. And we got him four fights in Mexico against really, really good opposition, and we put him on UFC Fight Pass, and he should be here by the end of the um, month, and if all goes well, he's supposed to fight in November somewhere here in the United States. So Yoelvis is, just to kind of wrap up with his fighting style, he's a southpaw, um, 154-pounder, who can punch with both hands, 
He is not a Cuban style fighter. He comes aggressive and forward to fight. And, um, you know, guys like, I, I don't know how much you've watched him, but he's just so fun to watch. He's got a great smile. He's like such a good, good kid. And um, I'm really, really excited about Gomez. So that's one guy to really keep an eye out for. And then I'd say the other one, um, um, Timmy kind of put him on already, and I was kind of mad because the deal hadn't been done yet. <laughs> but um, Christian Toon, <laughs> Christian Toon, Christian Toon. So Christian Toon is a six foot seven heavyweight um, German. He's in Miami now. Um, he's going to probably fight October 30th here on a club show in Iowa, and I'll give you guys the, the, the um, information. But um, Christian Toon, I'm really excited about. I'm really, really excited about him. He's 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 only six and zero. He's a really big heavyweight, and I think now uh, with the heavyweight division, you can't be a small heavyweight. You've got to be a big guy. So um, he's only had six fights. So I think um, with with my, they, my 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 partners in Germany have done a great job with him, and I think now um, bringing him to the states, he's going to get a lot of exposure on the heavyweight scene. So I'm excited about those two and a bunch of others that I could talk about forever. And um, I'll leave you guys with, you know, a funny story was um, I took Tim down to Mexico for his third or fourth pro fight, or maybe his fifth. Um, don't quote me, fifth fight. We went down to Mexico and it was on a club show in, in the back of a, uh, of a bar. And the weigh-ins went well and everything. And we saw our opponent and everything was great. And then on fight night, we, you know, everyone's wrapping your hands in the same room. There's one little light in the room. You can't really see anything that's going on. So um, we get into the ring and Chem looks at me right before it starts. And he goes, Shane, that's not my opponent. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, that's not the same guy that I weighed in against yesterday. So I was like, hold on a second. So <laughs> the whole thing had, to, we just had to just get that all clarified. It wasn't the same guy, but. Chem looked at me and goes, Shane, I, I don't care. Man. I'm here to fight. We went through all this. It ended up being one of the toughest fights of Chem's career. The guy was one in five, but I'm telling you guys, there's no guy, way that guy was one in five. The guy was hitting Chem with a kitchen sink, and luckily Chem won because he just has balls like no other. But that's probably where I was like, wow, boxing is crazy, crazy. Uh, uh, opponent being substituted in last second. Did, <laughs> did this that's happen such a uh, in the U.S.? No, that was in Tijuana. Okay. I don't think they could get away with that in the U.S. I was gonna say, like, I, I've heard a very, very similar story to this, but it was I thought it was kind of like joking, but uh, yeah, okay. Apparently, this is for real. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy, but yeah, we've no, seen that, was... that. We've seen that. We've talked about that kind of stuff on the show. Angelo, do you know where Chem's last fight was? Uh, yeah, I, of course I do. I looked up his box rack. Next it was where that was big it? punch. Big Punch Arena. Shane, did you get that fight for Chem at Big did. Punch? Did you? I did. I did. Oh, oh my God. Okay, so you could get Angelo a fight at Big Punch. <laughs> yep. and I think I, 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 you know, jokingly said to a few of my friends, one of my best friends is a guy named Aaron Ray. He's a, a good music, big musician out here. And um, I always said to him, Aaron, man, we should just get you one fight. You can turn pro. You can say you knock <laughs> someone out. And and you can be the guy that that unde retired undefeated. Like anyone can win down in t right down at the big punch. Oh, I yeah. listen, Angelo, you come here for six week training camp. I'll get you ready. A six day training camp. And then yeah, we'll I was like six hours. It's a big punch, man. <laughs> no, the training you know camp is the trip to the to the venue. 100%. You know what will happen? The same thing that happened to Chem is they're like, yeah, this guy's one and five. Turns out he's actually like ten and one, and you don't no one know. Told you. you don't know what yeah. you're gonna get, but. Some of those fights down there are wars because, like I mentioned, you know, these Mexican fighters, they, they come to win. They come to win. So, For sure. Uh, I would, if, if I'm going to, like, I want to fight Chachita. Chachita? We'll get, get you the Is easiest. that the one? Is that the one that I'm thinking of? Yeah, it's Chachita. Yeah, Chachita's, <laughs> yeah, Chachita's about 350, Angelo. So I don't think that's your... I, <laughs> I see uh, the, the yeah. reason why is because you can't fool me uh, I, like by showing up with a different opponent. I know what he looks like very clearly. Yeah, exactly. You, you, there there's, you no, go. there's no mistake in that. So I don't know if I'd win though. Listen, I think that at that, at that arena, you know, there's a lot of things that can be, can make, make happen. <laughs> All right. Well, that has been Shane Shapiro president of Shapiro Sports and Entertainment. We thank you so much for coming on and like 
showing the light on the managerial aspect of things, the promotional. I'm really interested to see what happens with Yalvis Gomez. I mean, I think you've got a few really interesting guys here that uh, specifically uh, the Cubans, but Yalvis Gomez is somebody that I specifically remember Tim pointing out as like, this guy's good. So I'm really looking forward to that. Hopefully we can have you on again in the future sometime. Uh, I mean, man, Yalvis Gomez is going to go work with Ishmael Salas, who's having a hell of a year. Yeah, this Salas is probably in my eyes like a top five trainer all time. Um, but we can get that to another time. That's the whole thing. But I want to thank you guys. I really, really do because this allows me to 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 get my story out and to other people that wanted to get into management or promotion at a young age and maybe people tell you don't do it or this and that. Do what makes you happy in life because life's short. And you know, do do what makes you happy and don't let someone tell you no. So I want to leave that positive message. I want to thank you guys again because you guys really do tremendous work. And without you guys, a lot of people wouldn't find out about a lot, a lot of fighters. And that's doing justice to the sport. So I really, really appreciate your guys' work. I would love to come on the show whenever you guys would love to have me. And I'm going to keep you guys updated with, with all of my guys' upcoming fights. And it was really, really a pleasure talking to you guys. I really appreciate it. Really yeah, we appreciate do too, Shane. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. All right, so that was our interview with Shane Shapiro. I hope you guys enjoyed that one. And that wraps up this week's show. We thank you guys so much for listening. Of course, if you enjoy the show, head over to wherever you, however you listen to it. Give us a great rating. Give us a good review. Share the podcast. I mean, really, if you want this to grow, the best thing you could do is just share. Uh, Tim, what else can people do? (laughs) You can check out the... All the links I have in my social media bios, whether you're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok will even get you there if you're <laughs> at TikTok, and uh, Facebook, even Facebook, and there's so much. Just click on my link I've in my bio. I've got it all there. Check out my Patreon community if you want to go even deeper than we're going now. I've got some really cool stuff that I only put in Patreon, but if you don't follow me on Twitter, I'd love to uh, interact with people on Twitter just as much as possible. And uh, thanks for listening to the show. What's that? I said especially about scoring. Especially on scoring <laughs> on the correct way to score around. Uh, yes. I, I, for those of you who don't get the joke, like that is the one thing I know Tim is not a fan of discussing is scoring fights. So with that said, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll be back next week with yet another episode of DTM.